people in other countries who get their limbs taken off because they believe in Jesus. Yet, in America, we, we get too lazy to read our Bible. Or we'll believe in one thing, but we'll deny the other because we don't like it. We'll pick and choose what we want in the Bible and make our own religion out of it. That's sad. That's really sad because the apostles and the disciples in the Bible were brutally murdered for believing in Jesus. They left everything they knew for him. In America, we have so much freedom that we take for granted. Yet, in other countries, they are literally being murdered for believing in Jesus. That's the kind of faith that we're supposed to have as Christians. We're not supposed to be lukewarm. Because the Bible says, I wish you were either hot or cold, but since you're neither, I spit you out. Sometimes we might think that we know Jesus, but then he's gonna say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And you're gonna say, but I believed in you. I mean, I read my Bible. for granted the freedom that we have by believing in his word because this word is holy and we can't pick and choose what we want in the bible you're either all in or you're not in at all i'll preach as a dying man to dying men and women and youth and i will preach as though I will never preach again. And I will tell you things that you will misunderstand. And I will tell you things that make you so angry with me. And I'll tell you things that you will deny. Because if I correctly interpret this passage of scripture that I'm going to give you, it is as though God were speaking through a man. And your problem will not be with me. It will be with God and His Word. So the only question that really has to be decided here this afternoon is, is this man before us a false prophet? Or is he telling us the truth? And if he is telling us the truth, then nothing else matters except conforming our lives to that truth. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I stand here today. I'm not troubled in my heart about your self-esteem. I'm not troubled in my heart about whether or not you feel good about yourself, whether or not life is turning out like you want it to turn out, or whether or not your checkbook is balanced. There's only one thing that gave me a sleepless night. There's only one thing that troubled me all throughout the morning, and that is this. Within a hundred years, a great majority of people in this building will possibly be in hell. And many who even profess Jesus Christ as Lord will spend an eternity in hell. 
What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates and a love for the things that God loves. A growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, not to be like the world, and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping, I'm talking about you. I didn't come here to get amens. I didn't come here to be applauded. I'm talking about you. You know what the Bible tells Christians to do? Examine yourself. Test yourself in light of Scripture to see if you are in the faith. The Bible says in the prophets that even our greatest works are like filthy rags before God. And because of that, you know what we deserve? The wrath. God, the holy hatred of God. You say, now wait a minute, God doesn't hate anybody, God is love. No, my friend, you need to understand something. Jesus Christ taught, the prophets taught, the apostles taught this, that apart from the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord, the only thing left for you is the wrath, the fierce anger of God because of your rebellion and your sin. When I speak in universities, they're always quick to point out, no, God cannot hate because God is love. And I tell you, God must hate because God is love. You see, I love children, therefore I hate abortion. If I love that which is holy, I must hate that which is unholy. God is a holy God. That's something that the Americans have forgotten. Now listen to me. If you're saved here tonight, you're not saved because the Romans and Jews rejected Jesus. You're not saved because they put a crown of thorns on his head. You're not saved because they ran a spear through his side. And you're not saved even because they nailed him to a cross. Do you know why you're saved if you are saved? Because when Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross, he bore your sin, the sin of God's people. And all the fierce wrath of God that should fall upon you fell upon his only begotten son. People say the cross is a sign of how much man is worth. That's not true. The cross is a sign of how depraved we really are. That it took the death of God's own son. The only thing that could save a people like us. The death of God's own son. Under the wrath of his own father. Christ, rising again from the dead. Powerful to save. This is the gospel of Jesus. Conversion is not like a flu shot. Oh, I did that. I repented. I believed. The question is, my friend, are you continuing to repent of sin? Are you continuing to believe? Because he who began a good work in you will finish it. The Bible never teaches that a person can be a genuine Christian and live in continuous carnality and wickedness and sin all the days of their life. But the Bible teaches that the genuine Christian has been given a new nature. The genuine Christian has a father who loves them and disciplines them and watches over them and cares for them. Jesus indicates that one of the principal signs of being a genuine Christian is that you walk in the narrow way. Now, I'm, am I saying that a Christian is without sin? No, because in 1 John we learn that Christians do sin. And if any man does not acknowledge his sin, he knows not God. He's not walking in the light. So what is the difference? What am I really getting at? What am I getting at is this. If you are genuinely a born-again Christian, a child of God, you will walk in the way of righteousness as a style of life. And if you step off that path of righteousness, the Father will come for you. He will discipline you. He will put you back on that path. But if you profess to have gone through the narrow gate and yet you live in the broad way, just like all the other people in your high school, just like all the other people who are carnal and wicked, the Bible wants you to know that you should be terribly, terribly afraid. What we have forgotten to believe is that salvation is a supernatural work. 
and those who have genuinely been converted, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be a new creature. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. One of the greatest distinguishing marks of a false prophet is that he will always tell you what you want to hear. He will never rain on your parade. He will get you clapping. He will get you jumping. He will make you dizzy. He will keep you entertained. And he will present a Christianity to you that will make your church look like a Six Flags over Jesus. You will know them by their fruit. How do you know that you're saved? How do you truly know you were saved? Because someone told you? Did you pray the prayer? Because you believe? Well, let me ask you a question. How do you know you believe? Because everybody says they believe. How do you know you're not like them? Do you know how the Bible teaches you that you know you are saved? You know you have been saved because your life is in a process of being changed and your style of life is one of walking in the paths of God's truth and when you step off those paths in disobedience as we all do God comes for you and puts you back on the path and what is the fruit that you're bearing do you look like the world act like the world do you have and experience the same joys that the world experiences can you love sin and relish it can you love rebellion and relish it? Then you know not God. Let me take it a little further. Let's imagine that I show up late and I run up here on the platform. And, and the, every, all the leaders are angry with me. They said, Brother Paul, don't you appreciate the fact you're giving the opportunity to speak here and you come late? And I said, Brothers, you have to forgive me. Well, why? Well, I, I was out here on the highway and I was driving and I had a flat tire and, and I got out to change the tire. And when I was changing the tire, the lug nut fell off. And I wasn't paying attention that I was on the highway and I ran out and I grabbed the lug nut. And as soon as I picked it up in the middle of the highway, I stood up and there was a 30 ton logging truck going 120 miles an hour, about 10 yards in front of me. And it ran me over. And that's why I'm late. You would say, Brother Paul, it's absolutely absurd. It is impossible, Brother Paul, to have an encounter with something as large as a logging truck and not be changed. And then my question would be to you, what is larger, a logging truck or God? How is it that so many people today profess to have had an encounter with Jesus Christ and yet they are not permanently changed? You will know them by their fruit. And he says, anyone who does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is he talking about? My dear friend, he is talking about the judgment of Almighty God that will one day fall upon the world. That will one day fall possibly upon you. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. This fellow who is making this profession, he is not someone who just all of a sudden decided it's judgment and I better profess him to be Lord. This is a person who emphatically declares to other people that Jesus Christ is Lord. He walks around saying Lord. He dances up in front while the musicians are playing saying Lord. He sings the songs Lord. But Jesus said to him, depart from me, I never knew you. There are many people who are going to profess Lord, Lord but they are not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. My dear, precious child, are you one of them? Look what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the sign that someone has become a genuine Christian? I wish that we would start teaching this again. What happened to our theology? What happened to our doctrine? What happened to our teaching? It went right out the window. No one wants to study doctrine anymore. They just want to listen to songs and read the back of Christian t-shirts. What happened to truth? Truth tells you this. The evidence, the way that you can have assurance that you are genuinely a born again Christian is that you do as a style of life the will of the Father. You say, oh, you're talking about works. No, I'm not. I'm talking about evidence of faith. 
How do you know that that faith you have is not false? A style of life that is concerned about doing the will of the Father, that practices the will of the Father, and when you disobey the will of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes and reprimands you, either personally, through the written word of God, through a brother or sister in Christ, and God puts you back on the path again. If you can play around in sin, if you can love the world and love the things of the world, if you can always be involved in the world and doing things of the world, if your heroes are worldly people, if you want to look like them and act like them, if you practice the same things they practice, oh my dear friend, listen to my voice, there's a good chance you know not God and you do not belong to Him. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You say the most important thing on the face of the earth is to know Jesus Christ. That is not true. The most important thing on the face of the earth is that Jesus Christ knows you. If I'm not going to get into the White House tomorrow because I walk up to the gate and tell everybody I know George Bush. But they will let me in if George Bush comes out and says, I know Paul Washington. You can profess to know Jesus, but my question for you, does Jesus know you? There are two ways. There's a narrow way and a broad way. Which one are you on? There are two types of trees. There is a good tree that bears good fruit and it's going to heaven. There's a bad tree and you know it's bad because it bears bad fruit and it's going to hell. It's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. There are those who profess Jesus as Lord and they do the will of the Father who is in heaven. And there are those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and they do not do the will of the Father who is in heaven and they go to hell. Not because of a lack of works, but because of a lack of faith demonstrated by the fact that they have no works. Let's get down. What does the Word of God say? How does your life stand in front of that blazing fire which is the holiness of God on that final day, beloved, precious, Little girl, beloved, precious young man, on that final day, will your confession hold true? You need to know. You need to say, okay, how am I supposed to live before my parents? Go into the Word, find out, obey it. How am I supposed to dress? Go into the Word, find out, and obey it. How am I supposed to talk? What am I supposed to listen to? Bring every thought, word, and deed into subjection to Jesus Christ. I don't wish the same things your parents want for you. They want for you security and insurance and nice homes. They want for you cars and respect. I want for you the same thing I want for my son. That one day he takes a banner, the banner of Jesus Christ, and he places it on a hill where no one has ever placed a banner before. And he cries out, Jesus Christ is Lord, even if it costs my son his life. Oh, when he's 18 years old, if he says to me the same thing I said when I was a young man, I'm going into the mountains, I'm going into the jungle, and they say, you can't go there, you're insane, it's a war, you're going to die, I'm going. When that little boy puts on that backpack, I'm going to pray over him and say, go, go, God be with you, and if you die, my son, I'll see you over there and I'll honor your death. Does your life honor Jesus Christ?